Hi everyone. Today we will be talking about how we can bring in uh, diversity and inclusion effortlessly into our lives and into our organizations. In today's panel, we have Joshita Tandon. Joshita works with SRF Limited. It's a chemical based manufacturing organization and has uh, around 15 years of experience in the field. She heads the corporate HR and HR analytics functions for her uh, organization and is also the leader for the DNI portfolio. We have Atulia Goswami. Atulia is the HR director at General Mills. Atulia has led the HR portfolio for multiple organizations in the past and works very closely on subjects like talent acquisition, talent management, learning and development, and employee relationships. We also have Apaya, uh, who leads the people and performance practice for Colliers India, which offers real estate management services across the globe. And uh, Apaya is extremely passionate about the subject of DNI. Thank you all for being a part of this discussion. Now, we all know that the diversity and inclusion, these are two very, very critical and important topics for ensuring that we have a wholesome workplace and also for providing equal opportunities to everyone. Though the awareness is increasing and we have seen that in the past few years, uh, especially in the workplaces, still in many organizations, this is looked at more as a social cause rather than a real, real business need. And hence, we need to bring in a mindset change, which can help us in creating a more inclusive workforce across the globe. And for this to happen, we need people like you who are not just interested in this topic, but also really passionate about the same. So now let's hear some of the real life experiences and stories from our panelists on how they got motivated to be involved into the DNI segment. Jashita, we'll start with you. Uh, you're from uh -huh. the manufacturing industry. Yeah. Right. Um, now, it, it's typically considered to be a very male dominated industry. What has been your experience so far of being a part of something which is so much male oriented? Uh, thank you for the question, Nisha. Being a lady, I, I would uh, focus my discussion towards gender diversity, uh, though diversity is not limited just to gender. Uh, yes, the manufacturing sector is considered uh, to be hugely male dominated. And we've seen that the rate of change happening in the manufacturing hasn't been as much as the rate of change that you see in other industries. It's unfortunate, but the winds of change are now you know, strong enough. And there's a lot of change that we're seeing nowadays. Now, when I started off my career, I'll give you an example that, you know, when I walked into one of my manufacturing facilities. I was the first lady over there. And, uh, you know, as parents, my parents had concerns for me and my safety. Now, at that point of time, I had no answer. I just said that, you know, uh, let me be and let me do what I want to do. But if I could comfortably say that there are another, you know, 20, 40 odd women over there who are managing and I'll also be able to manage like they are there would have been a certain amount of confidence that they would have gotten the whole process. And that's the biggest amount, biggest pain area that women talk about, that when they become change agents themselves, when they take on such roles in the manufacturing, there are a handful of women in the manufacturing sector. So when you get into the setup, you find yourself a little out of place in the initial period. If we could ease that, it'll make life a lot easier for women then only we can start about talking about other kinds of diversity because this is one diversity which i very strongly believe that because we are men and women are made differently one thing's more from the right side of the brain and the other things more from the left side of the brain so this is one diversity one form of diversity can that can actually lead to a lot of benefit there's enough research that suggests all you know the numbers speak for themselves and once this is achieved, then it paves way for bringing in all other kinds of diversity and becoming accommodating for other kinds of diversity. Now, in manufacturing India itself, there are only 12% uh, women. If you look at manufacturing, there are sectors like the textile, which is hugely dominated by women. There are sectors, there are companies like, say, for example, you pick up the companies like DuPont's, the Dow chemicals, these are all MNCs into India. 
they came in without any biases and they tried to you know work here without any biases and you see very healthy numbers in those factories and in, even at the shop floor uh, a tata safari today or a harrier today we all know in tata motors all tata safari cars and tata uh, you know harrier cars are manufactured by women by their own you know hands so there are enough examples now if you want to be like a company where only 1% women are there or there are no women and you get comfort in that it's a sorry case but if you make these organizations your role model you do have a road map you can see what these companies have done they've been successful and that's how you pave way for your change perfect so how was your first experience you know when you were on the shop floor you're the only lady on the shop floor was it a little intimidating for you see the intimidation part might be there but it's about how much you notice that there are there are you know three kinds of people i always say one who support diversity and they say that they support diversity there is another kind which says that i don't support diversity and they will be open about it now these are two categories that i can talk to i can try and convince the, the other uh, the latter set of people the biggest problem creators for me uh, are people who say that we are in favor of women at the shop floor they say that we promote diversity but when you give them 10 cvs they will reject eight out of those 10 because those eight are of women Mm-hmm. my biggest challenge was you know coming from those kind of people understand because they appear to be all well wishers but they will create roadblocks and believe you me it's got nothing to do with uh, an indian company or a manufacturing company you will find such people all across it's yeah. just a bias could be conscious or could be unconscious now as a lady you've got to be mentally very strong and this is something that i tell every girl who walks into my organization or any field i'll say you will come across such people you've got to be mentally strong be head strong be shameless there'll be situations you just have to keep knocking the door till the time that it opens for you awesome that that's a very nice thought to start with you know keep knocking the door till the door opens right till till you get the opportunity thank you thanks jushita atulya uh, you you're into the hr field you've been in the hr field for a very long time and hr is all about uh, you know people so what does dni really mean to you and how did you get motivated or how do you uh, get encouraged to move or champion this cause thanks uh, thanks lisha so uh, <clears throat> first and foremost uh, very good afternoon to all the listeners here and and this is a topic which is personally very close to my heart so anything uh, in the space of diversity and inclusion and and if we have some time we'll would love to share some stories from from the manufacturing world so i could relate a lot to what joshita was mentioning i got a chance to work in one of the greenfield projects in hyderabad where we had women working shop in the shop floor 24 by 7 so that was kind of my journey uh, almost i would say 8 years back from now <laughs> and uh, for me uh, personally if i have to talk about what it means to me in terms of uh, i i would say diversity and inclusion is a strategy right so it, it's not really a task or it's not really a scorecard you know which typic which is where we typically tend to you know start from an organization point of view so first and foremost it has to be seen as a strategy and also a true representation of your consumers because end of the day people who are working for you are also your consumers or are working for your consumers whether you talk about gender diversity whether you talk about pride community whether you talk about disability acid attack ex army professionals think about any element of diversity that we are talking about it's a representation of who your consumers are so just imagine a situation if i let's take a manufacturing example if i have five people who think the same who look the same who uh, have similar ideas work on similar elements where is my innovation where is my creativity where is my 
uh, you know, consumer element or consumer centricity, which is going to come into play. So for me, it's a very important business driver, right? So that's that's the kind of uh, purpose oh. you bring through the diversity element. But having said that, diversity it, to me is only representation. What is more important is inclusion. And this is exactly what Joshita was kind of hinting towards, you know, when she spoke about so many examples of people who don't walk the talk. So it has to be a very top-driven agenda. It has to be a mindset change. It has to be a culture change. So these three words to me become very important when you're talking about diversity and inclusion and the implementation, uh, you know, for any organization. Personally, for me, what drives me there is uh, maybe my upbringing, uh, if I may share the personal side of it. My mom is a doctor. Uh, she started practicing back in 1970s when a lot of women were not actually working. So I grew up seeing a role model right in front of my eyes. And to me, that's how my mindset you know, was built up over a period of time that Inclusion, diversity, women, specifically on gender diversity is something which is very natural. It's, it is something which happens, right? And potentially, you know, some of the assignments where I got a chance to work, I could see a potential to challenge the status quo. So where, again, I repeat and say that, you know, DNI, if it has to be successful, it is a mindset shift. It's not, it's a cultural shift. It's not really a scorecard based approach. If you're going to do that, you will hire people but end of the day, you'll not be able to retain them because you still will not be able to drive inclusion in your uh, in your setup. So to me, I think that's what diversity and inclusion is. It's a long range plan. It's not a short term fix. It's a lot of shift in the ways you think. Yeah, yeah. you're right. It It's basically, you know, creating that inclusive workforce, which is wholesome. Like you said, if everybody thinks in the same fashion, you don't get any innovation in place. So. Thanks, uh, Atulia, for sharing that. Apaya, coming to you, you know, yes. you are leading the people and the performance portfolio, you know, very loaded portfolio, again, to do with all people. How are you enabling diverse talent in your organization? You know, and, you know, in general, how do you see the industry moving? Do you see, uh, like uh, Atulia was saying, that everybody has that as an agenda? But do you really see that the industry is very conducive of this fact? of bringing in an inclusive workforce? What are your thoughts? You. Yes, thank you, Nisha. Uh, actually, what they said was it is. it needs to be top driven. It needs to, but you know, for me, it is all about, you may call it acceptance, awareness, compassion, anything that you deem fit. Uh, but the most important thing is accepting the change and be realistic. Like what uh, Joshita said, no, it's not about, you know, saying something and doing something else. So it, it doesn't work that way. We live in an ever-changing world. And with time, the way human lives have changed, you know, example, COVID, what we have just, all of us have gone through. But in time, we accepted the change and as a new normal and moved on. So should be the case with diversity and inclusion at workplace in our lives. You know, that's, that's what I want to, you know, sort of uh, sum it up in a short note. Okay, okay. And from an industry point of view, uh, Apaya, how do you see? Do you see that, uh, you know, from the leadership uh, side, right, you see that uh, people are encouraging this move? Or is it again more to ensure that you're meeting your KPIs? Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I, as I represent uh, a real estate industry, we do have on-site and off-site uh, staff, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, wherever the opportunity to provide a safe working environment and conducive to incorporate yeah. DNI, we encourage and try to see uh, how best we can accommodate such candidates. There is a challenge, but you know, it's always the push. You need to always have that push monitor and see what best you could do. For example, we have taken up the initiative by recruiting a specially able person. It's just a start, small start, but somewhere yeah. we need to start. At the same time, you know, uh, as a welcoming change, we have also seen from peers in the industry that wherever an opportunity arises, they try and incorporate DNI, which is a move in the right direction. So, you know, more and more people are thinking of this. So this is definitely a, a good thing. Right, right. And you bring across a good point. You know, sometimes it's also the logistical challenges, right? So uh, 
how safe is the whole environment for uh, a diverse workforce so i primarily come from an it industry i've always seen a lot of women around me right whenever yes. uh, we've been in a project and uh, late evening shifts or late night shifts uh, weekend working so at least you know the the kind of problem that joshita would face or somebody who is in uh, an industry wherein you don't see a lot of women right uh, at least we have not faced that right so of course this opens our eyes to some of these practical challenges as well right thanks abhay uh now when we talk about bringing in diversity right there is a term which is very popular in the industry which is known as unconscious bias right uh what happens is sometimes the way we are brought up the way we are conditioned uh, you know society uh, social stereotypes our beliefs you know many of these factors also impact our judgment or our thoughts towards a certain section of society or a certain gender and so on right again joshita you mentioned that uh, briefly when you were talking about your experience right earlier and um, maybe it's not coming across very clearly that the cvs or resumes of women are not getting shortlisted right or they are getting filtered out something like that so in your space uh, how do you see what are your thoughts on this particular uh, this concept of unconscious bias how can someone be aware of this and more importantly how do you think uh, a person who is aware that you know i am biased towards something how can i overcome that you are on mute ushita yeah i think you are uh, mute audible now yeah yes. so yes. thank you lisha thank you for the question see when you talk about the unconscious bias you know one needs to understand how does this whole concept of bias work and not all biases are bad so if i am say for example traveling alone at night i'm walking down a street and i see uh, on the right hand side there are two tall broad shouldered men walking towards me and on the left hand side if there's a, a man who's looking down and walking or doing his own work or is busy in his thought i'll probably tend to walk on the left hand side than on the right hand side now i'm saying that you know this is a bias that i have i don't know who is uh, you know a criminal or who's uh, uh, you know a normal person or whatever and maybe both of them could have both sides could have ill intentions pointless but it's a bias that i have and not not all biases are bad to have so all humans will have biases it is just that we've got to as leaders we've got to be aware that am i taking a decision based on a bias that i have or i'm taking a decision based on uh, data facts and is it an informed decision now we don't have so much time in our day to day world so if as a recruiting manager or as a hiring manager uh, there are 50 cvs or 40 cvs that one has to look through it's humanly impossible to do that job and that's where technology comes in you can bring in technology where the technology can tell you this particular decision has been based on bias or maybe data throws up that you know there's a pattern that you're seeing that this particular hiring manager is rejecting cvs now this this is this unconscious bias this whole thing of unconscious bias uh, you know works both ways there are women also who have biases there are so many boundaries or i call them limiting beliefs that women have uh, and i counsel i have rather counseled a lot of young women when they walk into the organization they come in with their you know blinders on saying that i can't do this kind of a job because this is a guy's job i can't be posted in that location because my family will not say yes to it and what i always tell people is first try try it out it's okay to fail there's a safety net even if you have to pick up a conversation with your family at least pick that up saying that i am getting a better opportunity let's all move to that location for example if the you know if one spouse has to move why is it the male who will be stable why is it always the lady who can't you know uh, take that decision so biases work in a very intertwined manner everyone has biases uh hiring managers have women have biases it's just that we've got to just take that pause every time you you know 
conduct an interview the decision it is said is made in the first 7 seconds so what i personally do is throughout the interview if my mind tells me in the first 7 seconds that don't hire the person the rest of the interview is about why i should not hire this person i try to counter my own 7 second the decision that i've taken in the first 7 seconds and that's what we are also trying to train our hiring managers to do your mind will throw some information at you that do this you've got to challenge your own mind it's it's an uncomfortable situation to be honest because you know it's not this one person who's taking the, this decision it's the human evolution a lot of our biases are related to our dna also and it's got nothing to do with me it's maybe to do with my forefathers right right i i remember a situation wherein you were talking about this right uh, we had a project uh, which was uh, catering to a north american customer right and what happened was there was a, a lady uh, the project manager was a female and uh, she was rejecting like you said you know look at the data so when we looked at it we saw that she was rejecting a lot of candidates who were females so we asked her what happened you know why are you rejecting so many people you are just filtering out the cvs so she said no uh, because ladies will not be able to work late hours right and this would require an overlap and we said you're not even asking right you're not even having a discussion with anyone you're just point blank uh, rejecting the cv because you have that thought process and maybe that is coming in from the pattern right maybe she's seen something like that her experience but you're right it it impacts you know what we have seen happening what we have observed what we have listened to all of that impacts but the whole idea is to be more and more aware that there could be and like you said some of these could not always be bad no not everything is negative some of these are positive as well but the the whole idea is to be more aware about this bias and then ensure that you're being able to consciously overcome it right so that you are uh, at least try it out right even if you are not completely convinced with it try this out you mentioned something about asking and i'll take just uh, 30 seconds more to share one example uh, mm. we had a couple working with us and uh, they became new fathers we had another opportunity in another location we very conveniently and i'm saying this is a management mistake that we made we've learned from our mistake we conveniently uh, discussed with the guy and you know offered him a role and other role and he was willing to go and the lady obviously had to follow uh, later on this uh, guy came back to us and said that we've become new parents if you would have asked i would have chosen the job of becoming a, the you know a caregiver at home because yeah. that's how i am wired i want to be at home i want to be with my children my wife is the one who's got that she's better a uh, higher iq believed by he believed that she was higher in iq more equipped to be in the corporate sector and he said if you would have asked me i would have asked you to offer this role to my wife rather than to me so just ask people whether it's exactly. the guy or the girl ask the girl is she okay doing that job maybe she says yes you're right i mean this is something we don't even realize right if the person would not have come back to you and discuss you probably would not even realize that this is but i think these are all lessons learned while we go ahead with our daily lives thank you thank you shina ajashita uh, atulya one thing right so we talked about talent management right uh, right now the whole industry is talking about talent we are all talking about people now tell us a little bit about some of the best practices because you work uh, on this day in day out right so some of the best practices that help us Uh, in attracting the right talent to the organization and also to develop an inclusive talent pool right like we discussed not just having people in is fine but you also need to ensure that they're getting the right opportunities right so how do you develop that talent pool, talent pool it's a very long answer let's let's try and uh, keep it as short as possible so it's like asking the bible <laughs> uh, or solving the entire world's problem so basically uh, you know I, i would go go back to saying that building the mindset in the organization that's and a lot of it which will happen to attract talent or uh, you know or the way you put it today the employee value proposition or your employer brand to attract gender diversity or diversity and inclusion in general 
starts with a lot of internal work that you do in your organization it's very less external i think external is a by product internal is how do you bring the mindset of leadership to start thinking about it the right way why why we are doing the why has to be clear and uh, that's where a lot of investment happens be it in terms of building the right allyship in the organization understanding the meaning of who should be a real ally what is the role of an ally unconscious biases lot of capability building in the organization to prepare the managers of people because that's where the challenges happen right so whether you are in supply chain whether you are in commercial side of business biases are everywhere yeah women can't work in sales women can't work in plants right so you have biases everywhere and how do you get away from that by building the right capability of your leadership managers of people a lot of times i have seen you know why we fail in terms of diversity and inclusion is because everybody is talking about a number to be driven yes. hr drives the process leadership is not bought into the process and eventually we end up hiring people who don't stick to our setup i think it's the other way around it has to start with hr being out there and actually making sure that people understand the why portion of why you want to do the dni uh, you know program for your organization why it's a cultural shift so i think if you are able to bring those right internal best practices to really prepare the organization before you go live with your diversity and inclusion program i think that's a very important whether you want to call it a best practice or a basic practice i would say that's the starting point for us second thing that you have to look at is what are your policies right how do you create the right environment before you get the people and you imagine a situation now companies talk a lot about pride community lgbtq plus hiring today guess what you are hiring a transgender you don't have a gender neutral toilet yeah are you really prepared in terms of policies are you really prepared to support them with the basics we are not talking about frills a lot of times companies people start perceiving this as frills for uh, you know special section in the in the organization that's not true and that's where the why and the why of doing that why uh, in terms of the policy has to be made clear to people and that's what we don't do a lot of times that's that's where we fail a lot of times in organization so uh, give you an example from one of my sales hr stints where we had to give a uh, facility to women employees who were in sales working in tier 3 locations and we are talking about agrochemical setups which are working with farmers where you are selling pesticides or chemical products to farmers uh, or distributors in far flung areas do you imagine a woman can work without a car or a driver facility we we may not have ha- have offered typically to a male employee in that case because they were able to manage it but there were some special exceptions taken to make sure that this facility is given and it is driven by a reason there's a safety element to it there's a security element to it a similar thing in a plant experience when we started the factory there was a gps enabled uh, cab which made sure that there's a point to point transport that's that's not uh, you know something which is a frill it's a basic requirement you you will not be able to operate without that kind of a setup so i think that's that's another piece and third piece is your hiring which becomes much easier right so if you are able to create the right climate with the right readiness of leadership the right mindset the right capabilities with the right policy framework i think your ability to attract talent becomes pretty automatic you know it's a very yeah. automated process and and this is something i quote from one of the ad agencies or brand companies i was working with they used to say i asked them a very simple question who will make your video i want to put out a video which becomes a viral video a youtube viral video they said you will not be able to do it your employees and your consumers will do it if you are able to do it with the right intent so that's what dni is right so if you get the basics right if you get the inside stuff right outside stuff will happen automatically you don't have to go out there with a loud speaker and say that hey i am a very diverse and inclusive organization your employees will be your advocates to talk about that absolutely you you very right because that happens right when we talk to our peer groups right or within our network when we talk about things one of the things when especially when you are changing at least as a woman when i am looking for a job change first of the, the first thing that i look at is what kind of policies are there for you know flexible working how safe is the environment and all of that so you you're right when you say that there are certain things and if you make it inclusive in true sense right you will automatically attract the right talent right uh, so you don't have to 
put in a lot of effort towards marketing yourself. It's it's your people who will go and market it uh, on your behalf. On that point, I also wanted, I missed one uh, uh, important element of your introduction, Atulia. So Atulia is also a, uh, an avid YouTuber. You can look up uh, for his channel and uh, he's a LinkedIn uh, influencer as well. So in case, uh, you know, you wanted to know about that. Okay. Apaya, one more question for you. Again, yeah. it is related to more people, people side of it, right? Uh, we all talked about everything. We talked about mindset change. We talked about unconscious bias. We talked about cultural conditioning, ensuring that you have the right environment to you know, ensure that you are creating a diverse uh, and inclusive workforce. Now, all of this is good. Again, you know, talking all of it is fine. But then, like we said, there is an element of passion that needs to come in. We need to ensure that people are really passionate. And if you have that passion in the organization or within your team, automatically these initiatives will be driven. You don't need to go ahead and spend a lot of time in finding out the right volunteers for it. So how do you make people more passionate about this whole cause, right? And I'm talking about everybody, you know, from the leadership side to people who are just joining the industry. Are there any, uh, you know, again, best practices or examples that you can give us wherein you have been able to make people passionate about uh, diversity and inclusion? Okay, yes, Lisa. Yeah, as you know, Atulia also mentioned, I think the key word is awareness. It all starts with that, creating the difference with awareness and then being able to practice this in our daily lives. You know, that, that's, the, that's the way forward. At work, we would also need to go the extra mile to create an ecosystem for all to coexist. Again, what uh, you know, he had mentioned, you know, we need to ensure that's there first. As a move, you know, as best practices, what we, we have done so far in a, in a small way has been, uh, as a move ahead, we have got all our leaders of each of the service lines committing to increasing the DNI by signing a DNI, DN, uh, DNI agreement, you know. So at least that is also creating awareness for them. We also had all our leaders and people managers undergo a training on unconscious bias. Many a times, you know, you don't realize it, but till you go through the training, you know, you take a lot of things for granted, as earlier mentioned. So, you know, that's, that's very important. You realize that in some form you are biased. So that's something which, uh, you know, is required. Talent mapping. Uh, we need to have talent mapping to increase diversity. And that's also a challenge, again, because if you look at for uh, predominantly, if you look at civil engineering, there are not many uh, women who take that up. But of course, this is earlier days, but now it is increasing. So that's where you need to really make that extra effort. And uh, that leads to, you know, we need to continuously apply the lens of inclusion, uh, constant monitoring, which also includes even, even curtail, uh, curtailing it to attrition. You know, we need to also... Uh, what we call shut the back door, what we mentioned it, uh, in our terms here at Colliers. So we also need to make, make that. Uh, uh, the other point uh, which we have been uh, driving is uh, uh, we have an em employee referral policy, wherein there is an additional referral bonus, which is paid to uh, uh, someone who is referring a DNI candidate. So these are the few things we have started off with. And it's, uh, again, back to awareness, which would, uh, you know, people get aware of things and then it helps them to uh, take it forward. Right. I, I think the first step is always awareness, right? When we yes. talk about unconscious bias also, unless and until or anything, you know, any problem in life, unless and until you're aware that there is a problem, you can't find yes. a solution to that. Absolutely. So. Very rightly said. And uh, the talent mapping it also, right? Uh, so that's, again, something which is uh, very, you know, important, right? To map the right talent. Like yes. uh, Atulia was also mentioning that there are some places, you know, women in sales, women in, um, you know, specifically a remote place. So unless and until you give them the right logistic or the infrastructure yes. Yes. to operate, it is sometimes a bit of a challenge for people, right? Um, so one of the question, and I don't have anyone specific in mind, I think you can all share your own thoughts. What do you think are the challenges? So we talked all about, you know, everything under the sky to make DNI uh, mainstream, right? Uh, a part of the business. But uh, what do you think are the real life challenges, right? Uh, apart from the awareness 
part of it right is there anything that you see as the major challenge a challenge which is not letting us move at the right uh, pace of creating an inclusive workforce can i go first I, uh, okay uh, sure yeah so i think in my personal experience uh, and also professional experience of uh, starting the greenfield project one challenge mm-hmm. real challenge that i saw is the intake of women at itis and you know especially if you're looking at setting up a factory and typically you're looking for uh, iti mechanic or you know fitters or typically the roles which you do in a in a manufacturing setup i think the availability of talent at source itself is very limited so you you will find women uh, mostly in different trades which don't work well if you're if you're going to hire for those kind of positions because they require certain specialized skills now the answer to that the anecdote to that is of course you can hire diploma engineers and train them and bring them in which we did but the point to ponder for uh, the government or for the iti mechanism industrial training institute mechanism would be that how do we increase that intake how do we build that awareness because i think there's a huge amount of bias and it's it's a lot similar to women not taking up careers in mechanical engineering you'll find a lot of women doing electronics and communication and computers and different setups so how do you break that bias at the ground level you know so so that things become easier even for corporates you know it's it's always uh, a two way process it takes two to tango so i would say you know availability of talent in certain specialized cases is is a real challenge that i personally came up with okay yeah good point joshita uh, so you had something like, to add like, yeah uh, see the there are two things that i will talk about one is this whole which i think is the biggest challenge is the paternalistic thinking that we have uh even when women come to the shop door or even when you are able to hire women a lot of uh, you know i'd say these are well wishers who who tell you that you know this is something let's not give this job to a lady she will not be able to do it comes later but she will she's not meant to do it so i'll give her the easier projects uh, if uh, say for example you have to deal with the government officials you've got to deal with the bureaucrats or maybe somebody in the police or someone you'd rather you know send a guy in your team rather than sending a lady it all comes from the paternalistic thinking and basically you know if you look at the paternalistic thinking it comes at the back end it's trying to protect the lady yeah i say that it's good to provide safe infrastructure safety is obviously a prime concern but please expose her to challenges real world challenges the root cause of this is th- th- this is a term that we co- quite often hear that you know i am uh, only trying to do good to her ask her maybe she wants to get exposed so that paternalistic thinking has to go i and this is something that you'll even hear in families that i allow my wife to work i am okay with women smoking i mean who's even asking you so this paternalistic thinking is the biggest challenge uh as atulya was saying and i am not limiting now to women but uh, when it comes to people with disability see there's a lot of there's a sense of responsibility also that one has to own and that is another challenge so just because hr is saying that we should increase diversity it should never be the case it has to come from the leadership you're hiring a person with disability please have the basic courtesy to provide infrastructure to the person and it is it is coming from that sense of responsibility and that sense of respect the other person is as human as you are how yeah. can you expect the person to come into your organization just because hr has asked you to increase the numbers and not provide infrastructure basic infrastructure that is necessary for the person to perform his or her job i mean i'd say this is basic courtesy so i think those two challenges to my mind are at present in my mind the biggest roadblock because it's all in here whether it's the paternalistic thinking or the lack of owning responsibility right right absolutely i think that is key right and i really liked uh, that statement that who even asked you right <laughs> it's it sometimes we we become advocates of our own beliefs and thought process and then we we just 
make ourselves look great by saying oh i'm i'm fine with this uh, this whole idea okay yeah. perfect i think uh, yeah. sorry apaya you have yes. something to add i just had yes. one thing is uh, acceptance actually we need to get that acceptance from uh, you know from the leaders like rightly said when hiring they always you know they so uh, we all fixed in a way of just uh, you know hiring a, a male candidate but no one really uh, you know steps out and says whether we could you know have a female candidate as an example absolutely. yeah absolutely okay uh, i think that was a very very interesting uh, discussion good to hear all your thoughts i'll just give you 30 more seconds to each one of you to leave our participants and audience uh, with one thought that you want to uh, you know want to stick with them right so 30 seconds for each of you to just you know leave one word or one thought uh, with our audience so if dna is not in the dna these are e- this is easy to remember right? dna dna then it's bound to fail i'd say the you know speed of change is so rapid that people who are not willing to change will be left behind and so far behind that they'll not be able to recover so you yeah. you you'll be forced to either change or you will be left or awesome. okay. you become yeah. obsolete it's, if you don't change yeah for me it's uh, you know create an inclusive environment for that the change uh, management needs to be top down driven and we need to practice what we preach that's perfect a lovely thought to leave our audience with thank you very much it was i had a very good time uh, interacting with all of you and listening to your thoughts and uh, you know i hope the audience had the same over to you ankita thank you very much